Bienvenidos al canal del Grupo de Estudio de Hormigas Neotropicales. El día de hoy presentaremos la charla Symbiotic Interactions Shape Animal Biology and Promote Biodiversity a cargo de la doctora Manuela Ramalo de la Westchester University. Síguenos para más información relacionada con hormigas y no olvides suscribirte. Do you know Manuela Ramalo? Dr. Manu Ramalo is a biologist from the Universidad de Estudio Paulista, Geology Mesquita Filio, a magister and PhD in molecular and cell biology from the same university. Currently, she's a postdoctoral researcher at Cornell University in the Murillo Lab and the Babonis Lab. However, soon she will be joining Westchester University as an assistant professor. Dr. Omalu's current work focuses on symbiotic interaction. Her emphasis is on the mechanisms such as the role of ecology, diet, behavior, stage of development, and even phylogeny that influence the evolution of symbiosis. Dr. Romalo has worked with a broad assortment of animals, from Nidaria to ants, her favorites. Besides being a scientist, she loves to talk about and spread science, which rich is her passion. She likes to use ants to engage people with science and together with some friends created Mulieres Descifrando a Ciencia, a scientific outreach page. Moreover, Manu shared with us that she loves cooking for friends and also she loves dancing. When she was a teenager, she enjoyed the Spice Girls and she still knows the choreographies. She's considered a gear power and ginger spice forever. Are you seeing my, my presentation, Maria? Yes. Okay. Let me just put you. Okay. So let me know if you're, if you're, for some reason, my presentation stop. <laughs> okay. So thank you everyone for coming. So it's a huge pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, I also want to thank you everyone that is organizing this amazing group of Armigas Neotropicales. Uh, thank you so much for the video, for all like the kindness invitation and for organizing all of this. I'm a huge fan of the group. I'm always um, seeing all the talks. I have been always uh, watching the talks later on YouTube. So it's an uh, immense pleasure to be here today. So today we will talk about symbiotic interactions that can shape uh, the animal biology and promote biodiversity. And I'm Dr. Manuela Hamalio. And if you saw my talk, I, you already know that I'm always like sharing the beginning of my Twitter because I believe that Twitter is the social media of the scientists. If you don't have a Twitter, I really recommend create one just for science. It's pretty good. Uh, I need to say by my experience that I have engaged with great scientists over there and I found great papers there too. So if you don't have a Twitter that think about it, but by the end of the talk, I will also uh, share my contact. And if you have any questions now or in the future, please, uh, I would love to talk and reach, reach me and I would love to talk more about that later. So uh, before we start, so I wanna give a privately um, uh, outline from the talk today. So we will first start to talk a little bit about uh, introductions of symbiotic interactions and how this is really important for a group of ants. Um, and I, uh, Maria, are you admitting people uh, in the room? Yes, Manu. Oh, okay, great. Just because they are showing here, I'm not sure if should I do it or you are doing it. Okay, great. Um, I'm sorry. And then we will talk about how the ecologians uh, and the host phylogeny both are important to shape this microbiome diversity. And before we finish, I want to take some uh, time and opportunity to also talk a little bit about another passion that is uh, diversity and inclusion in science. So to understand the patterns of bio biodiversity, it is important to consider symbiotic interaction as they can shape the animal evolution. But this symbiosis can be variable and complex, which makes our task a challenge, but also fun. Uh, as an example, how this interaction can go crazy, I have, I like this example here that it's a bug in a bug in a bug. So we have this um, muddy bug over here that has a diet deficiency in amino acid. So the, the muddy bug alone cannot get all the nutrition that they need in order to have a healthy life. 
So the Melberg then acquired uh, this endosymbiont, as you can see here in blue, called Tremblaya. But a fun fact about this Tremblaya, Tremblaya has uh, the smallest genome known so far. So Tremblaya alone is not able to do this job anymore. So Tremblaya, to fix this problem, acquired another endosymbiont, as you can see here, highlighted in red, called Modanella. And another fun fact about this Modanella, it's that I was named after another woman in science, Dr. Nancy Morrow. So I think it's a pretty, a pretty amazing way to honor her. Um, and another crazy uh, important um, information about Modanella, Modanella has an audacity to have the genome four times larger than actually the Tremblaya where they live inside of. So that's crazy. And that's a perfect example as Modanella lives inside of Tremblaya, who lives inside the Malibug. It's a crazy example how uh, symbiotic interactions can be complex, but again, also fun. Uh, but how we can explain all of these diversities of symbiosis? How can we change this symbiosis? So these are questions that intrigues me and I love to understand. Um, and one of the key studies conducted by Lay and collaborators in 2008 was able to investigate a different groups of mammals and they, and, and they saw that the bacteria interactions uh, and they saw that both diets and the host phylogeny could explain part of the diversity that they were seeing. And talking specifically about bacteria, um, we already know that different biomes, different biogeographic regions, host phylogeny, different diets, and also different development stage, they can all impact and influence uh, the bacteria community. However, uh, what about other systems? For example, all the all the 18S. What I mean by 18S is all the fungi and nematodes associated with the host. We still know very little about these other groups that lives with us. And uh, another very interesting aspect of these interact symbiotic interaction studies that we are seeing that every paper that has been have been published, there's no one absolutely true. So, which means that every system has its own caveat, and again, makes our tax challenge, but also super fun. And I don't think I don't need to explain to you in this group why ants are really cool, <laughs> but um, turn out the ants are perfect system to address these questions about interaction symbiosis, interaction symbiosis, because um, several groups of ants rely on important tasks on the microbiome partner. And one of the example here, we have these groups of the tribe Camponotini ants have this real cool association with this bacteria block money. And several studies in the past was able to demonstrate how this interaction actually really important for the host. Uh, for example, they even demonstrated that uh, these bacteria, these ants cannot survive uh, without block money, especially in the beginning of their life because block money it's providing very important upgrade nutritional for these ants. And with that important function, um, makes sense that these bacteria are being ascending directly from the mom through the egg uh, for the workers. And I have opportunity to uh, find exactly the moment where these bacteria reach the eggs yet inside of the queens in the eggs, uh, in the ovary of the queen. So again, what is true for one group may be not the true for the other one. And um, the other group of ants that I like to highlight it here, it's a group Pesodomunix, where um, the authors, um, when they started this project, uh, there's one group of, uh, there's several uh, groups of species of Pseudomyrmix that have this interaction with this acacia plant. And so the authors, when they started this, um, this study, they, they, tried, they thought, that if they look at these ants uh, highlighted here in this phylogeny in green, uh, that have this association with acacia, they thought they have this association with impact in the bacteria community associated with the host. And turn out they have opportunity to compare other, other pseudomimics, that one that has the interaction with acacia and there's, there's no interaction with acacia. And they saw that there's no difference between um, the bacteria in both groups. So the bacteria, the players here are the same. 
But turned out what they identified, and that was pretty cool, was the abundance of the bacteria were different between those groups. So again, we still have a lot to learn and to understand when we are talking about bacteria interactions in ants. And I hope, uh, and for the big questions that I wanna bring for the talk today, I wanna focus and understand uh, what is the factor that can shape the composition and the abundance of the microbial community. And we will focus both in how the ecology aspects and how the phylogeny can both shape uh, the symbiotic interactions. And we will start um, my results focus in uh, Dacetum Armesium. That's a pretty cool ant that lives in the tropics. And they normally have like huge colonies with thousands of individuals. And the bigger workers, they have their predators and they protect the colony. Uh, and the smallest workers is the care of the broods or the, the larvae. And we have opportunity to collect these colonies and uh, and for this particular project, we want to investigate how the, uh, how the bacteria community and the eukaryote community, their difference between different colonies, different sample types, different casts available inside of the nest, different development stage. We also had opportunity to compare samples that was in a wild and then kept in the lab for a while. And also the important aspect of the different diet ones that we bring the colony to the um, to the lab. And so how do we do that? How we did that? So we collect these ants, we bring part of them to the lab, and then we call it, we feed them for a while with uh, sugar, water, and cricket. And then after a while, we collect these samples again, and then we call time well. We let the experimental goes by, the time goes by again, we collect again after continuing with the same diet. And then we, now we call time two, because we want to see if after a while being the lab, if you will see that the changes in the microbiome will be more similar or not. And we also included the diet in our study because we wanna make sure that if the difference that we are seeing are coming directly from the diet. And let's go. So uh, I know that this is a busy figure. So don't worry about it. We will go together what is the taking home here. So every column here um, means a different, um, a different ants, a different sample, and I, every color a different bacteria. And when I got these results, the first thing that came to my mind was the diet was different to the other ones. But the other thing that was like just by my eyes, I were able to see that all the broods and the larvae, they have a different bacteria community associated uh, different than the other ones. And again, this kind of data set, they're so big, they're so intense that we cannot rely on our eyes to generate, to make sure that that's what's happening. So we definitely need to apply other statistical methods to see if what we are seeing is actually true. And uh, so we did that for all of the categories that I mentioned with you before that we want to investigate in this um, question, this paper. And we are able to see um, this is an NMDS plot, which means that samples that have similar bacteria communities are similar to each other, or the dots will be close to each other. If you're seeing that the dots are spread apart from each other, they are more different. So when we apply the statistical and look in these graphs, uh, we can see that belong to a colony and being a worker or a brood um, has an impact in the bacteria community. However, we didn't find difference when we look at different sample type, the gusters with the whole body of the ants. We also didn't find difference between casts. We didn't find different, and that's what different that we expect. We didn't find difference when we compare samples that was kept in the lab, the sample that was kept, uh, collected directed to the field. And we also didn't find difference between the samples in time one and time two when we are investigating the difference diets, the diet. Um, so, and we believe that this has happened because um, these bacteria, these uh, ants, they have already a stable um, bacteria community that, that didn't allow the next bacteria coming from the diet uh, set down. So the other, uh, in the next steps of this paper, we have opportunity to work in the, now looking the 18S on the nematoids and the fungi associated 
uh, with this with these ants. And um, one thing that different in the bacteria community here. Uh, so e again, every column means a sample, and every color a different um, eukaryote microbial. And first thing that you can see is that all the the larvae in the pupa they seem different compared to the other one. However, did you now with this data set, the 18S, we have the majority uh, return just yellow. And yellow here means that we are not, we just, uh, the analysis just stopped in eukaryota. We can go further uh, in the data set uh, to get, to try to high, to get, to try to have a higher resolution of a different taxonomy, um, um, a better taxonomy resolution here. And this has happened because different than bacteria community, our data set for eukaryotes, our database are not that update. So unfortunately, we, we cannot go further than eukaryote here. So uh, maybe we should consider improve that in the future, this database, and we can I can come back later and, and realize what kind of like eukaryotes are happening here. However, we apply the same um, the same categories here, but even though um, the others, but uh, others, we are not able to get better resolution than eukaryotes, and we can um, get we can get more to know about the different colony sample type, cast wild and lab and diet. But we are able to see that development stations having a great impact on this. Um, these eukaryotic communities, even without uh, good resolutions of our database. So even that, going further with this analysis, we decided to exclude other eukaryotes, all the eukaryotes, all the yellow that you're seeing this graph that didn't was able to get higher resolution, uh, taxonomy resolution. And even though you can see that our data set was able to re recover a pretty interest in diverse um, groups of eukaryotes. And I don't have time to go through all of them, but we are able to find some apes, rotifera, algae, nematoids. And talking about the nematoda here, we were able to identify um, entomopathogenic nematoid associated with our dacetal ants. And again, although we are not know what kind of interaction these taxas are engaging with the ants, um, for example, if they are prey or if they are pathogens here, but uh, this 18S could be used as an important tool for help us to understand more about the general biology of this host. And I summarized from this paper, uh, for the bacteria community, the 16S, we know that belong to a colony and development stage seems impact, uh, and we should consider them uh, for these groups of ants. And for micro, for 18S, we cannot know much besides the development stage that could impact them, However, our data set was yet uh, able to recover a pretty diverse um, eukaryotes associated with, this, with those ants. So returning for original questions, um, ecology seems matter, at least for that here. So I'm gonna move now for the next, uh, the next topic in our talk today. So now we will talk a little bit about how host phylogeny could impact um, the microbiome here. And what I wanna do, the, the, I think the biggest idea here is have a robust phylogeny. And this kind of data that I already present for you, this uh, from the acetone paper, uh, this microbiome data, and then you can we can try to look for co-diversification signal happen here. And uh, so we, we have opportunity to do that um, in 2017s uh, on this paper, working with polyrats, where we are able to get the best, uh, the, the most up-to-date and supported phylogeny by the group in 2016. And we are able to find some signal for co-diversification happen here when we look at the microbiome community. Uh, so from this paper that I want to present next, we will focus now in um, turtle ants. So this is a picture of turtle ants, and they are no like cephalo cephalodes. Uh, they have these uh, symbiotic interactions with the gut bacteria for more than 45 million years. And these gut bacteria, 
uh, they have a really important role for these uh, holes. They, they seem to be uh, crucial for um, recycling nitrogen. And although we know uh, the function for some of these turtle ends associated bacteria, there's yet uh, still many open questions regarding that. Um, so in this paper, for example, Sanders was able to, Sanders and collaborators in 2014, uh, they investigated, they were able to investigate 25 different species of turtle ants, and they did find a sign of for a co-diversification co here. So uh, I want to highlight that, that since 2014, the way that we are analyzing our data set, they change a lot, and the way that we are generating this data change a lot. So what we want to do next is now increase this number um, for more than 75 different species uh, and, and different than, and also included the 18S uh, data set that I already present some of them um, in Dacetum. So with that in this uh, new paper, what we want to, uh, what we will hope now it is investigated the ecological factors um, associated with cephalots, looking both the bacteria and the eukaryotes community. And we also want to, we also want to test now if the both bacteria and the eukaryotes communities associated with these turtle ants are interacting with each other. And if you, we do find this core bacteria community, the, the, the main bacteria community here, uh, we want to look for a signal for co-diversification now including much more samples here. Um, so first, through the Phylocore R package, we're, we were able to find this core community uh, of bacteria associated with turtle ant, as you can see here in this heat tree. Uh, but we are not able to identify this core community for the HNS, which makes sense because the HNS seems that it's more variable. So it's, it's harder to find uh, what core community that it's happening every single uh, sample that we are uh, include in here. Um, and another important aspect of our data set, so now I think you already know how we identify this, uh, interpret this kind of data set for a microbiome study. So every column here means a different sample and every color is a different bacteria because this is a 16S, uh, so it's a bacteria. So when we, one of the things that was more interesting for me when I got this data set um, was that how we can, uh, the, the same bacteria are being recovered, doesn't matter who, what the technology that's being used or the, the, the different papers being used in almost a decade, the same bacteria is happening. It doesn't matter if you're looking in ants collecting in Texas or ants collected in uh, Minas Gerais in Brazil. So, means that they have a really conserved gut microbiomes, which makes sense, right? Because if you think that part of these bacteria are providing a recycling nitrogen, that's a really important uh, role for these, um, these bacteria associated, right? Uh, and when we uh, look at the 18S uh, data set, we end up having the same issue that happened with the Dacetone data set. So everything that you are seeing highlighted here in, in gray, it is actually uh, cannot get in a higher uh, taxonomy level. So they stop in eukaryote here. But even though we are, we can see that there's some other uh, taxes, pretty interesting taxes associated with these turtle ends. Again, uh, next we want to look um, uh, what is the impact of belonging to a species or different biogeographic regions on this uh, bacteria community? So this is a PCOA plot, and the same way that NDS plots, dots, they are close to each other, they have more similarity with each other. When they are apart, they have a diff more, more different than each other. So when we apply this statistic to explain how it's belong to a species on the geographic region, we can see that bulls have a huge impact on bacteria community for turtle ants. And when we do the same for the 18S, the all the eukaryotes associated, and we can see the belong to a species seems that matter, but biogeographic regions seems that it just matters when we are looking the uh, when we are just looking the composition and not the abundance. So again, 
we still were working this data set to uh, understand more what that means and how we can explain all of different, but seems that uh, the increasing of um, the data set here for turtle ants seems to have already a huge impact on what we know so far for turtle ants. Um, the next uh, step, what we wanna do now, it is investigated the associations between the library 18S, uh, that is eukaryotes, and the 16S, how they are interacting with each other. So, so now we wanna investigate if there is a correlation between these two different libraries that we're seeing here. So we first excluded all the correlations that was not significant. So everything that you are seeing here in these two networks are the negative correlation highlighted in blue and the positive correlation highlighted in red. And we, we are still trying to understand uh, and seeking for meaning for all of these interactions, but this kind of results uh, shows that in the future, we may be much considering synergism and antagonism when we are considering um, for even for organisms from different kingdoms analyzed together to investigate the consequence and the function uh, for these different organisms for one host. So stay tuned, we will get to this, uh, we will get there. And next we will focus now in the co-diversification. So I think again, the idea here, the recipe for get this uh, test done, it is has, uh, you need to have a robust phylogeny and this data set for, uh, for example, the bacteria community associated with the host. So we had opportunity to, uh, to have actually, it is in prep here, but it's not in prep, it was published. I need to fix that in the talk. Uh, so Price and other collaborators, they have, um, they published this year um, phylogeny through using the tech, for cephalotis, uh, using this technology that you see is ultra conservative elements. And I had opportunity to get exactly the same samples that was included in that paper and generate all the, file, all the microbiome data that I present for you in the previous slides. And we want to now investigate it, uh, the signal for co-diversification using three different methods. First, apply the Montel test to see if both are co-diversification, see if we can see that there is a correlation between both. Um, we also want to uh, apply this PACO test. This is our package that was specifically developed for focus and co-diversification signal happen between the parasites and the holes. And we wanna visualize all of these interactions through a tendogram. So what should we expect it? So when you put like these two, three together, the phylogeny from um, uh, the host, the ants, and the phylogeny of the bacteria, uh, if it, there is a signal for co-diversification, we should see these lines more straight directly in each other, like the trees are mirror. But if the trees are not mirror, if we can see some chains, uh, we will try to connect this dot between the both three and we will start to see some tangles like that will be not easy to see that. Of course, by this kind of data set, they are so intense, this big data that we're talking about that just our human eyes are not able to actually get uh, the results sometimes just by looking with your eyes. So we do need to, we definitely need to apply some statistical tests to help us uh, getting what is the actually meaning of that. So that's how, how our results looks like. So before um, we go further, so I know that it's a busy figure, we will go together, what is it taking home here? Um, so first thing, instead of to um, put all the bacteria community, all the core community in the same one, three, we decided to separate it, all of this uh, main bacteria, the car community, because we believe that every single bacteria can have a different history with the host. Um, so I think the, uh, every, everything that is highlighted here by these results in purple show the significant results and those in the yellow there do not. So, which means that from all the core uh, community bacteria that it's consistent, 
seems that the only Burko did Yasia was able um, to come back with the both mantle test and Paco test um, significant. We suggest to us that uh, only Burko de Yasia is being acquired vertically and has been codified with the host ever since. Uh, and this also suggests to us, and if you look for the other side, both Acetobacteriaceae and Volbachia, both are consistent, not being um, co-diversifying with the host. So this suggests to us from, uh, that from all these other bacteria are being acquired horizontally, either from the environmental or even from an intense interaction with this colony through the trophallaxis with other, other taxa. However, first studies need to be, with experimentals in the lab, need to be conducted to confirm this trend. But what is crazy for me about this data set, it is that, um, remember that these kind of data set are being consistent and being remarkable conservative, even when we are comparing different studies from different technologies. So it means that these bacteria are being required, the same bacteria are being required from the environment uh, from, doesn't matter if it, these ants are in Texas or these ants are in Minas Gerais. So that's pretty amazing. Okay, so returning for our, um, our original questions here, or the main question from this paper, how is the impact for phylogeny both in the composition and abundance? So it seems that uh, phylogeny here is explaining part of the data for polyrex, but for, uh, turtle ants, it depends because now we can see that for Bur Burcoderiaceae, it seems that this is true, but not for the other groups of uh, bacteria, for example, Volbachia here. So again, we still have a lot to considering and uh, we definitely need to come back to the lab and do a lot of like experimentals now focus maybe in different strays and different technology, for example, shotgun metagenomic, or uh, genomics from these bacteria to be able to get more resolution to see if there is one strain of bacteria that could diversify and the others do not. Okay. So now I wanna take opportunity um, to talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion in science. And so in this other topic, this part of this talk, I wanna focus in, in, in talk about women in science, parenting in science, how the pandemic affect um, academia, uh, how the pandemic is affecting everyone, but differently inside of science and uh, outreach in science. So all of these was uh, topics that always was very important for me, but I think after this pandemic, this becomes, this become even more, uh, important, at least for me. And uh, you can ask yourself, or maybe some people here in this talk never uh, had opportunity to, to read more about that or, or, or engage in this kind of conversation, but some people are, sometimes are women in science, parenting science, underrepresented in science, what do that matter? So several studies, and this is just one of example, have already shown that uh, a diverse group of science with people from different backgrounds are able to do science with more quality. So if we, even if you don't care about the human in science, parenting science, the underrepresented group in science, I hope the scientists are considering um, increased diversity in your group, just because there's already showing that quality in science could be achieved when we are focused in a group in a, and we have opportunity to work with people from different backgrounds. And even if you do, so if you want to do quality in science, uh, you need to consider increase the diversity in our in your research groups. And it's already show that it's already know that STEM careers, uh, science, technology, engineer, and math, um, has a reduced numbers of women. And there are several causes uh, for women do not engage in these careers. And there are also several stereotypes in our society that discourage a woman for pursuing prestigious careers. So if you're already, so we definitely already I losing some talent here, but even if the woman decides to anchor in the STEM careers, she will still face a problem with the lack of female representation, um, which is usually present here as a leak pipeline metaphor, as you can see by this graph. So what do that mean? So which means that 
uh, as the woman career advance, uh, there's a reduction of female representation, as you can see by these graphs here. And the causes for uh, the woman decided uh, decide to leave um, the STEM fields are plenty, are many, but uh, lack of a friendly environmental work and maternity leave are, are just one of them. And these numbers here, uh, we stop in this, uh, this data stop in a woman after PhD, but these numbers could be even worse when we are considering full professors. And several papers already address these problems and causes, but together with Dr. Cynthia Martins and Dr. Carmen Rowe and I, we, we wanna specifically assess the female representation uh, in the field of myrmecology. So we, in this study, we searched for more than 5,000 of ants related paper, papers published since 2019, um, 1990s uh, around the world. And we focused Lucas in both in gender and the first author and the last author. Because the first author, we thought that it's a proxy for the student at the beginning of the career. And the last author we are focusing uh, as a proxy for a senior positions in our career, career, for example, PI. And in both positions, women are minority in myrmecology, as you can see by these graphs here, these numbers here. And we also had opportunity to compare uh, the progress of these positions over time, as you can see here in this other chart. And although you can see that there is an increasing uh, of the position, especially the first author highlight here in red, um, in, the, in this red line, this is still not significantly different from the, the average, as you can see my, um, with the dot, um, the red dot line. And this scenario is even worse when you're analyzing position as the last author, as you can see by this blue line here. And but more than they show all of these injustices in our field, we also made a series of suggestions to improve uh, inclusion and diversity in academia. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all the suggestions here, but I want to highlight one tip that we wrote here for all men. So men, if you are majority in science, we need to count on you as an ally to overcome these injustices. Let's do this, let's make this change together. And another important paper that came out on this same subtopic uh, conducted by Andrea Lucky and collaborators in 2020. Um, and I definitely, if you didn't have opportunity to read it, read it because it's really good. Um, they have opportunity to look that for the same shoot of the female representation in the myrmecology community, but they were also able to expand and look at all of this diversity uh, in different countries in the world. And that they saw that countries that culturally support women to engage in STEM careers has more uh, effect and impact on female representation than even the GDP. So this is, was really cool. And the other report aspect uh, of this study, uh, one of the cool things about this study is the authors look at, at um, the numbers of single tone papers, which means that people who publish just once in a myrmecology field and never publish again. So when I compare these numbers, uh, women sign out more for these papers than men. Um, so uh, when we put this in a big picture here, we can see that myrmecology viewers are indeed att attracting all the talents, but for some reason we are not able to retain. So if you think the way that uh, how many years uh, we need to study to continue uh, pursuing our career in mimicology. We cannot, uh, we definitely need to consider that we are losing a lot of like training time and a lot of talent here. So we definitely should uh, consider rethink um, a different ways to continue attracting all of these women to our field, rotation these women to the field. So changing gears a little bit, but not so much. Uh, finding a balance between personal and professional life has been uh, a challenge for everyone, especially the parenting science. And several manuscripts had the opportunity to address this subtopic here. And uh, one of them was led by a Brazilian group called Parenting, parenting Science. And um, they show it that these parents start to recover from the impact on their right of the ch children 
after uh, the third year. And so together uh, with other um, parentings in amirmecology here, uh, we want to go focus specifically in amirmecology that it feels that uh, our field where field trips are often important. And so together with other moms in the myrmecology, we ask for the entire myrmecology community, um, scientists with kids and without kids as a control group uh, to answer our questionnaires for us to see how is the parenting in myrmecology are doing. And so our results compare both like groups with kids and with no kids in activities such as uh, numbers of publication, numbers of uh, propo grant proposals, numbers of mentee, numbers of class that uh, taught. And for all of these activities, uh, we didn't find difference between groups with kids and without kids. Um, and this is activities that was um, associated with uh, a regular routine. So which means that the scientist doesn't need to, norm normally doesn't need to leave the, the house routine um, to do these activities. However, when we considering um, different, when, for the field trips, for the number of public to speak and or even attending conference, uh, the normal is our activities that require, require the scientists to leave for their regular routine. So we still find difference between groups with kids and without no kids, um, even after five years of the arrival of the children. So if you already have been in a Congress, uh, in a meeting, a symposium before, you know that this place are normally like going to a conference like Myrmecology meeting. It's um, on that place where the researcher continue to learn, meet new students, um, organize new collaborators. So if you wanna retain the talent in the academia, in the Myrmecology field, we need to create a way to overcome the impact of the arrival of the children in the researcher's life, such as, for example, creating a space kids, a space kids, um, kids space at events. And this is a practice that's being more common here in US, but yet not being common um, in the worldwide. And if you want to talk about how we can do that, we have great ideas. And I know that there are several groups of, um, of uh, several groups of societies already start to think about how do these, at least what I know in Brazil as well. So now we are in the pandemic, almost two years. And um, all in the pandemic, all these injustices are even worse. And uh, editors of scientific journal have already observed a decline of numbers of papers submitted by women during the pandemic period. And these numbers are even worse when we are considering mothers in science. So if you think how our scientists career are being evaluated, so we need to definitely rethink um, how we should be done for the coming years. Or women in science, we still carry on this decline of productivity uh, of the pandemic for the many years to come. And institution must retain and consider gender asymmetries for distributions of funding, careers advancement, assignments of leadership positions and expanded scholarship. All these are very important for humans to succeed in science. And that way we will achieve all, we all achieve more quality in science as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk, take like the last minutes to talk about outreach in science. So this is a, a word cloud. Uh, that I have opportunity to create, just copy and paste from my CV, just the outreach section from my CV. So as you can see, I've been involved in a lot of cool and crazy things. And, and uh, uh, when I started to get involved in all of this kind of activity, um, I, was, um, I was excited just to do it because I think this is, was interesting. And I was worried about spreading, explaining also uh, for friends and family, why ants are cool and why I like pursuing science career. But today, I really believe that this has become more and more essential. And um, part of this, I really believe that part of the science denial that we are currently experiencing um, in the entire world came from our failure as a community, as our fa failure to communicate it as a scientist to the society. 
And I really believe that if you want to reach more people, we need to communicate about science in a simple and accessible way. So outreach and public engagement in science is one of my motivation as a scientist. And during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit us, everyone was reminded uh, that science can bring a lot of benefits to society. Um, and, but then um, in the fake news area, uh, who should we trust? Who we can find like good information? Where we interpreted all of this science jargon. For some people who does not have academic background, this interpreting a paper could be very complicated. And if you think that still has the language barrier where a lot majority of this paper have been often published just in English, this means that also the information is even more restricted. So uh, together with other Brazilians and friends, in the beginning of the pandemic, we decided to create a, this coalition on science communication called Women Deciphering Science. So we are Women Deciphering Science, and we believe that the world could be a better place with science. And with all that power, science should be for everyone. So through infographs and a simple language, we spread science on the several uh, social media platform, both in Portuguese and in English. And I, we started especially like just proving pandemic related fake news, but we are also using our page to talk about the importance of insects. And we also saw this as an excellent opportunity to amplify other women's and another underrepresented scientists all over the world. Um, so here I invite all of you to follow us and also to make suggestions of topics for our, um, our um, page. So if you love, we, we would love to use our page to publicize about your research area as well. So if you have some suggestions, if you want to share a cool paper, or if you have any idea what things that you think will be cool, just keep in touch, let us know, and then even if you, we don't know, um, how to talk about, we can always find someone that will be a great, um, we can find someone who knows about the tube topic and we can figure out an uh, infograph, an easy way to communicate about science. And with that, I love to say thank you for everyone. Thank you so all for listening here today. Thank you, Maria and everyone for Hormigas Tropicalis for the invitation and for organize everything. So I also need to thank you, Cornell, my house now, uh, NSF for funding, all the women in science that always support my career, everyone from Human Deciphering Science, uh, everyone for the Moral Lab that our um, support day by day. And if you have questions now or in the future, please contact me through my email, through my Twitter. And I also need to say that soon, um, in August, I will start the Hamali Lab in Westchester University, Pennsylvania. So please come to visit me. And if you have any questions now or in the future, I will love to talk more about it. Thank you. Um, well, um, thank you very much, Manu, for your talk and for mm -hmm. accepting our invitation. Um, and congratulations for your new position um, as an assistant professor. Um, so while well, we open the questions section, so if you have some questions for Manu and her presentation or also for her um, initiatives uh, with Mulheres uh, Inside Science, well, all questions are welcome. Thank you so much. May I present my question vocally? <laughs> yes, please. Okay, so that, there's a tremendous amount of little critters living inside these <laughs> ants, apparently. And yep. uh, uh, I, I guess, um, uh, how many of them might you say are just incidental as opposed to actually being important to the physiology of the ants? That's a really great question, James. And turn out that this is depend a lot. So I had opportunity to work with um, uh, Ada, 
uh, Liefekater ants in another paper um, collecting in Brazil. And uh, they have a um, tremendous uh, amount of transitioning um, bacteria happen over that. Um, it's less common. Uh, we still have a lot of them in turtle ants, uh, but it's less common when we focus on turtle ants or psilomyrmix ants or campanatus ants. We still have some transitional bacteria, but not the majority as the case that the, the papers that I presented today. But yet, um, this kind of data set that I present for you, they focus their 16S amplicon or 18S amplicon. So they're normally, mm, we can see if they are there or not. So we can have answer questions more related like the ecological aspects of that. Um, for no, actually, if they're transitionary or not, we need to design another kind of experimentals in the lab. Or if you, want, if you want to go further and test what is the function, if there is a function for them, uh, for the host, we should focus in a different uh, methodology that probably genomics or shotgun metagenomics where we can have like actually different genes from the bacteria and then we can see what kind of like function they are providing for the host if yet there is something. Did I answer your question? Uh, well, it, it sounded like a for kind of an elaborate way of saying word we don't know yet. <laughs> and, but, and the depends for so many things. Like yeah. if you're looking like different species, uh, this is already changing enough. So if you right. are looking like comparing bacteria uh, ants from uh, New Arctic here in US compared for ants in uh, Sao Paulo, south of Brazil. So that's already enough changing. Right. So yeah, we don't know yet, but it's everything very complex to answer that. Yeah. The, the other question, I did have a second one, was about yeah. the, the eukaryotes. And it just surprised me that you were retrieving uh, DNA that seemed to indicate there were uh, birds and other multicellular things in, inside the ants. I guess that's from their foraging uh, bird droppings or something like that. Is that yeah. what you think? So when I saw the results that I find like DNA from birds uh, in the Dacito, and I also found some evidence of uh, DNA from fish. And I was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, are they eating fish? How is that possible? So after I think a while, like Corey and I, we end up like thinking, okay, they are arboreal tree. Uh, they are arboreal ants. So they probably like uh, end up walking around in some like nest with birds and um, re remaining like fish carcass. So that's why like, this is a very, if you think that's a very powerful way to see what ants are eating. So mm -hmm. we can even use um, this kind of 18S data set to see, to learn more about the biology of these ants. But yeah, I was really surprised for us too. <laughs> I hope that in the future, the database of the 18S will be more update and then we can actually have a high, a high taxonomy level for all of the majority of the data set that we generated with this 18S. Thank you so much for your question. Oh, you have a lifetime of work ahead of you. <laughs> That's so true, I love that. <laughs> well, okay, um, we have a question from Professor Hamis Montoya, and later we are going to give uh, the talk uh, to Inge and Lina. And the question is, so far, the most of the information available is for bacteria. What about fungi, yeast, and viruses? Thank you so much, Professor James Montoya. So nice to see you here. I can't wait for us to see you in person again. So for people who don't know, James Montoya was in my PhD defense. He was a, one of the professors in my bank in the, my defense. So, um, so you're answering our, your question. So yeah, the bacteria we know more because that's the most updated database because once you generate all of this data, so many like thousands of reads, we need to get this all of this DNA and like blast them in a database. So bacteria database, it's very update and it's always update like sometimes like four times per year or more. 
So because of that, we always know when we can try to, sometimes we can get even like the species level of identification for what is the bacteria inside of the ants. The same thing uh, when we are considering the 18 as database, when we are focused in fungi, and you also say is here, um, we, this is not that update. So we cannot, we still have DNA from there, but we are not able to actually, sometimes they stop in just eukaryota. Sometimes they stop in just mammalia. So we cannot go, go further and we still are not with this technique, we still are not able to actually know what they are, which is kind of sad. But if you, we, instead of to use HNS, if you will use the ITS, uh, this is a specific um, gene for fungi, we can uh, get a better resolution for fungi associated with ants. And we have one uh, work in progress uh, where we working with Amanda Oliveira from Brazil as well. Um, and she was able to, uh, she was, focus and the eating as sponges associated with um, ADA. So we are looking forward to see her results, but it's interesting things coming. Uh, virus, virus, we still know even less, we, we know even less about that um, because again, everything depends on the database. And if we still are learning for fungi, for virus, it's, it's yet so, which means that we will have work, we can work with this for the rest of our life. But again, stay tuned. There is a great student working at Peter Fling, uh, also working with Corey, uh, PhD student almost finishing working with Corey here, and he is focused in virus. And I can see he you should guys invite him to talk about that, but what is he is able to increase a lot of the virus associated with ants, no, more no things about virus associated with ants. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank Mary. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hamis. Thank you, Professor James. Okay, thank you very much. It, it, very nice to see you and your initiative. Uh, my regards to Corey and thank all the people that we know each other. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. You need to come visit us. Okay, I will think about that. Okay, so Professor Inge Ambridge has. Um... Uh, hi, thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> um, finally, I could enter. Thank <laughs> and you. I am uh, <laughs> wondering about the last part of your talk uh, about equity and the gender <clears throat> issue. Uh, can you widen a little bit um, on how can we empower better? women the options that you get very quickly now but it's it's really a need and i think that is a a, a very important issue that do, that you that you took so thank you very much for that uh, just explain a little bit how can we uh, <laughs> uh, get uh, a better position in terms of equity Thank you so much for pointing it out, Ingrid. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so yes, I agree with you, obviously, that we definitely need to do a better job. And there are several ways where we can empower women to continue in our mimicological field. Um, one of them is give them the opportunity to share their work as what's happened here today with me. So, other ways that we can do that, it is like we create this women deciphering science. So we are using that uh, page to tell like the, the background, the history about other scientists, other women in science. And we are hoping by, we are the, through the social media, especially like we can empower young teenagers uh, to seeing other women like doing cool things in science and they can see this as a role model. Uh, so that's another way. One thing that it's already happened um, in the last Myrmecology in 2019 was all the keynotes in the Myrmecology meeting had that happened in Brazil in 2019. All the keynotes was the same like uh, majority of males and females, uh, women and men uh, presenting science. And I also believe that we, we definitely need to continue doing that, like get, giving the same opportunity for women and men 
to talk about the work, but uh, we can go further than that. And instead of to be just the keynotes now, the same amount, uh, we can thinking that all the myrmecology mean, all how much women are presenting the paper, uh, their, their research today, how many men, uh, and maybe not just like go through posters presentations. We can also give awards for women in science. Why not create a myrmecology award uh, and women in science and, and like give the, amplify the work of other women. And when I say women, doesn't need to, I feel that every time that we're talking about this uh, kind of um, problematic issues, we should not, our discussion need to be, uh, we cannot forget it about the intersec intersectionality of this discussion, uh, which means that uh, we should, we cannot, we cannot forget about the uh, the black women in science, all the G L S B L G. Oh, my 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 spelling is terrible. L S G B T Q I plus community and uh, all the uh, social issues that we have. And if you we are talking about women science alone, uh, our discussion will be excluded. And we don't want that. We want to increase diversity as the most powerful way. So we should definitely work together in a different way. How can we do that and make sure that everyone has their voice? Thank you so much for your question. I always love to talk about that too. Um, well, thank you very much, Manu. And Lina has uh, questions too. Yes. Thank you very much, Manu, for your talk. It was very nice. And mm -hmm. I have actually like, one question. Uh, you show in your first uh, study that uh, you found um, uh, you found the same the same uh, bacteria community inside of the same colony and inside and between workers and brood. So did mean this means like kind of vertical transference inside of the ants, right? And then, but you found that between the colonies were different or was, was also the same? So I think you were talking about the first paper about the acetone. So we found in that paper, we, we found that the two different colonies that we, we had opportunity to analyze, they have a different community when you compare one colony to another one. But when we look inside of that same one colony and we compare inside of that colony, okay, they're different than each other, but now let's focus just in a colony level. And I, I kept I keep in that analysis just the ants that belong to that colony. Uh, and then when you look at that, you're able to go in another level and see, okay, what about all the broods, all the larvae, the pupa, are they actually different than the other workers? And the, it is. And if you think how we can explain that, so I think you, the larvae and the brood, uh, the pupa, not the case, but the larvae are eating like a different food than actually like the workers. And we are able to see that in the bacteria community. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I wanted to like give this direction to my question because it's actually related with food. So have you tried to collect like um, kind of natural history uh, traits or information behind the species and actually inside each colony? to try to like kind of track this information and yeah. correlate it with the results that you're obtaining with the community inside of the gut? Yes, we did. And um, so for example, uh, I mentioned that what we think that was happening was the different eating. So yeah, in fact, like the, the what we know for the biology for these groups of ants, that's actually happening. Like the larvae has a different food source compared to the workers, but um, for example, remember that I showed that when we bring the colony to the lab, we compare like samples that was in the lab and samples that was a while, we didn't find a different. And what we are 100% sure that we are fitting them um, with the same food, the same thing. And we still were not able to find any signal of difference between the time one and time two. What I think it was happening is because by that time, uh, we didn't have larvae. So, and what I think it was happening, I think all the diacetone uh, worker, they are not feeding enough 
because they're already worker. And there's other groups of ants that we know that when they are already working there, they, they don't need to eat that much compared when they are larvae. So what I wanna do next, it is come back and do the same experimental, but now instead of to just feeding the workers, because we didn't have larvae by that time. So what I wanna now, it is focus and changing the diet on the larvae and, and tracking the development and all the other phenotypes that we will see after that. And I think when we do that, we will learn really cool things about the impact of the diet and development of the host. And that's what I want to do in the Hamalia lab in Westchester. That would be great. But the, do they do trophallaxis? They, I think there is, so that's another very cool thing. So we have few papers, I think maybe two or three on this group of ants of Gasseta. Uh, and they have, I think they have a trophallaxi, but there's no much, we don't have much evidence of that. Okay. Like it's yeah. totally different than, for example, if you talk about like turtle ants or campanoids, mm -hmm. and we know that this is happening yeah. all the time, and we know, but that's it turned on. So, I what I think is that it's cool is that we are learning more about the biology of these groups of ants that is so hard to collect and so hard to like um, had opportunity to see them. Um, but looking, but now learning all of this by looking in microbiome data. So it's pretty cool. And then just the last, the last question, because also yeah. in the, in the, in the other study you mentioned about, um, again, like, uh, you found difference in composition, but not in abundance between the species, right? Yes. The 18, yes. So all right. we, yeah. So this and is actually happening a lot in this kind of data set. We see that like the bacteria are sometimes the same. The, so the, I, I like to use like the players are the same. It's the same bacteria that's happened there. But if you change like the development time, development, or if you change um, the bigger geographic range, you, the bacteria are always there, but the, the needing for the amount of bacteria is changing. Yeah, because also when, when you show that also you found the differences uh, at, at um, biogeographical level, yeah. then of yeah. course this could be also related with the food sources that they are using. Absolutely and, true. I, I could agree more. Yeah. And did you track that in that in in, in that um, study, or uh, have you think to include that or? So in that study, uh, in turtle ants, we included more than 75 different species. So we cannot, we, unfortunately, we can't, can't, we can't get all the information for all like the, the fooding uh, habit is for all the 75 species. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and it's turtle ants, it's, it's crazy. We like, are they, what they're eating? Are they eating pollen? Like, like yeah, so that will be, like as James say, yeah, we need to work this spring our entire life now. <laughs> yeah, it would be great that there that there is more like um like history information related yeah. to the ants available yeah. for this we, kind of studies. We have a lot of by like um cephalogies uh, atatus. there is great like uh biology papers, like just like, the general biology about everything. But for other groups of uh, turtle ants, like le last year came out a paper with uh, seven or eight new species. And now what we need to do it is like, I have like, I had opportunity to, I had some of these new species and we we're like, okay, now it's a new species. Let's now learn what they are. And it's really excited. I'm, I'm so glad that I have like part of this new data that was came out like last year in my data set to, know more about what kind of bacteria are having this new species that we didn't know there was a new species. But again, we have all the life to work on that. And that's amazing. Yeah, still there is some work to do. I agree. Oh yeah, some. Thank you very much. And <laughs> thank then you also so much, thank Elena. For, thank you so for, much. for all the things that you are doing as well for women. We are there also. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. We are together. Yes. Which will? <laughs> well, and Camila has a question too. 
Manu, congratulations for the talk. As always, I'm so impressed with all the work that you've done. You are my inspiration. No, you <laughs> so are that's mine. That's amazing. <laughs> so I have a question related to yeah. the study of microorganisms. So I know that in order to have like accurate data, we have to start by collecting the, sam the, the samples, the ants, like in a correct way and in a specific way. So how we can take advantage of all these biological expeditions and say to our colleagues, please collect samples for me, please we collaborate with me, and what are the protocols that we should use in order to study the microorganisms associated to the ants? Oh my God, I cannot be more happy than this question. So yes, if you want to include microbiome data in your study, in your data set, let's talk. <laughs> so that's one of the beauty about uh, this kind of date. Um, for normally for field trips in myrmecology, if you are collecting for phylogeny, for you normally collect your ants and you put inside of a vial with 95% ethanol, that's it. That's the kind of data set that I need to do the entire gene or entire microbiome data set as well. So in fact, I present some data that was Price and other collaborators published with the phylogeny of turtle ants that was published, I think 20 days ago. Um, I had opportunity. So they used the, the, we made the DNA extractions and the same DNA extractions that go through phylogeny from UC phylogeny is the same input of that asset that we can do for microbiome study. So it's straightforward. That's great. Thank you so much, Manuel. Yeah, thank you. And I need to point out, depending on the questions that we want to go for them as I present. So the first paper for Dacetone, we want to know more about the ecology. So we definitely need to get the entire different uh, casts available in the colony. So we'll be better if you collect the entire colony, um, try to collect the entire colony, and then like is, uh, make samples from different development stage, count everything. But for a turtle ants uh, paper that I present, um, we, we didn't, uh, I would love to collect the entire colony for all the 70, more than 70,000, 75 different species, uh, but we didn't, it was just like one ants collecting in one place with like all the coordinators together, all the dates and everything, that's the, what we needed for the paper. So depend on the question, but 95% ethanol, that's good. Thank you so much, Manu. I don't know if Thank you. there are many other questions. So, and um, thank you, Jaime, Javier. Thank you so much. Venha visitar o Ramalho Lab. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know if we have more questions. In the meantime, we want to say thank you again, and we have what, what we how we can find you, like. What is the best way to contact you? Like by email, by Twitter? In, anyway, anyway work. We are all in the social media. All, several one has my contact by cell phone. Uh, sometimes I'm not available because you no, know, it's my ch small child. It's hard, but always, I will always figure it out a way. Great, thanks so much, Manu. Thank you. So Rodrigo Feitosa says, excelente mano inspiradora como siempre. Oh, obrigada, Rodrigo. Você é sempre querido. Thank you so much, James. Great. Since we don't have more questions, Manu, again, congratulations for the talk. I hope to be there in the Ramallah lab for sure. For sure. Yes. I need help. I need help. <laughs> Please come <laughs> visit me. Thank you, Manu, and see you next time in our next Encuentro Mirme Ecológico. Yay! Thank you so much. I can't wait. Well, thank you very much, Manu, and thank you, thank you for everything to, to be in here in this Encuentro Mirme Ecológico, and see you in 15 days for the next meeting. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.